Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. So, I watched Disney's adaptation of Owen Colfer's Artemis Fowl this weekend, and to say it has problems is an understatement. To be fair, making an adaptation of a popular series of books is no easy feat. Concessions and alterations will need to be made to fit the new medium of storytelling, and it's impossible to fit everything from a novel into a 90 minute film. However, fans will generally excuse a few slight changes so long as the key themes remain intact, while audiences with no familiarity with the source material won't care about keeping the lore, they just care that the movie's entertaining. Unfortunately, 2020's Artemis Fowl fails both the fans and the newcomers. It's aggressively unfunny, difficult to follow, full of cardboard characters, and it completely throws out everything that made the book series charming. The movie follows Artemis Fowl, a legend criminal mastermind, as he discovers that fairies, goblins, and dwarves are real. It turns out his father, played by Colin Farrell, has known about their existence for a long time, and when he mysteriously disappears, Artemis finds himself thrust into a fantasy world. Now, in the books, Artemis hatches a scheme to kidnap a fairy from the Leprechaun team so that he can bribe the fairies into giving him gold, and, more importantly, into curing his mother's insanity. In the movies, Artemis' mum is straight up dead, throwing away the original character's main motivation for his criminal endeavours. Right away, eliminating a major plot point is going to aggravate a ton of fans, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Let me tell you the story of Artemis Fowl. Okay, so let's get into some backstory about this production before we get to all of the sinful plot changes. The first big red flag here is that the movie was in development hell for almost 20 years. The film changed hands multiple times. When Miramax first bought the rights, Lawrence Gutterman was first signed to direct and Jeff Stockwell was signed to write. Then it was supposed to be Jim Sheridan directing, but that didn't work out either. The movie was also once supposed to be executive produced by Robert De Niro, but presumably he caught on to the fact that the film is bound to be a mess and his credit was gone. In the end, the adaptation was directed by Kenneth Branagh and written by Connor McPherson and Hamish McCall. The biggest problem I have is that Kenneth Branagh actively wanted to work on the film and apparently understood the themes and characters present in the original novels. However, for whatever reason, he decided that audiences wouldn't like the character Artemis Fowl on the big screen, despite being hugely successful in the world of literature. In an interview with Slash Film, Branagh explained why they decided to completely destroy the personality of its titular character. It was a decision based on a sort of inverse take on what I saw in the books, which was Owen Colfer introducing Artemis gathering a sense of morality across the books. He had him preformed as an 11 year old Bond villain. It seemed to me that for the audiences who were not familiar with the books, this would be a hard kind of thing to accept. What is he talking about? Watching Artemis grow out of being a morally questionable little brat is the most interesting part of his character. Owen Colfer himself has stated that his books are essentially about Artemis growing up and learning that exploiting people for his own gain is wrong, so changing his means of character development throws out an essential core theme of the series. And of course, Brenner's comments beg the question, why on earth would you make a movie based on a criminal mastermind if you genuinely think this would be a hard thing for moviegoers to accept? I mean, if anything, trends have shown that audiences love anti-hero criminals. Just look at the success of Breaking Bad and Venom. But no, the director thought that was way too much, so the film makes it so that Artemis has never committed a crime prior to his father disappearing, even though the whole point of the books is that he runs the foul criminal enterprise. I'm Artemis Fowl. And I'm a criminal mastermind. No, you're not. And you know you're not. Even more frustrating is that Brenner has experience adapting films from text. In fact, most of his filmography is novel to film adaptations. After his adaptation of Disney's Cinderella, which made the mouse a buttload of money, Walt Disney Studios asked him to work on Artemis Fowl and mostly gave him free reign to do as he pleased. This means that most of the film's shortcomings weren't just about the initial production issues. A lot of it seems to be directly the fault of the director and screenwriters. By canning important elements of Artemis' character, they reduce him to little more than a cocky kid in a suit who's sad that his dad is missing. These supposed filmmakers also decided to cram in plot elements from multiple books into one movie. Opal Cowboy, who isn't introduced until the second book in the series and becomes the main antagonist of later books, is shoehorned into the movie and made into the main antagonist. She kidnaps Artemis Fowl Sr. because she wants the all-powerful Aculos, which Artemis doesn't realise is actually in his own house. Apparently, Opal's motivation is that she's angry that humans have demeaned fairies in the past. However, nothing in the movie really suggests that humans suppressed magical creatures in any way. In fact, it's sort of implied that they don't even know they exist. In the novels, Opal is a genuinely foreboding villain, but in the movies, she's this ridiculous cloaked figure who is portrayed by not one, not two, but three different stand-in actors. 
Her voice is super modulated for some reason, and it doesn't sound scary at all. She sounds like a kid who started messing around with Snapchat voice filters or something. She has no presence as a villain whatsoever, and she feels like a first draft of a character. Opal even does the cliché, <laughs> When her plans are foiled, it's absolutely insulting, and the fact that they managed to get Golden Globe winner Hong Chao to voice this awful, awful character is downright baffling. What other characters does 2020's Artemis Fowl screw up? I'm glad you asked. Mulch Diggums is played by Josh Gad, who can't seem to decide whether he should be making Mulch funny or gritty. He gives Mulch this strange, raspy accent. It sounds like Olaf trying to do a Batman impression, and it's grating to listen to. Of course, Mulch is narrating the entire movie, so you have to hear that weird voice a lot. The Oculus, a weapon so powerful and mysterious, it can barely be imagined. This leads to another question. Why is Mulch narrating the story when he doesn't even play a major role in Artemis' first plans and couldn't possibly know about half the things he's narrating? It makes about as much sense as him pooping sand. Yeah, you heard that right. Mulch Diggums poop sand now. They ditched his killer flatulence in favor of sand pooping. Fairy Special Forces Officer Holly Short has been completely changed around too. Instead of giving her, you know, any character traits present in the original series, the geniuses behind this production decide to force in some tragic backstory about how her father is dead. This is presumably to establish some sort of parallel between her and Artemis. I mean, the two of them immediately stop being enemies and become friends once they realize they both have missing dad issues. It's about as ridiculous as the infamous Batman v Superman scene, where they both learn their mums have the same name and stop throwing hands at each other. Truthfully, this iteration of Holly is impossible to care about because, well, she's just as two-dimensional as Artemis. I don't know anything about her, just that she's 84 years old, short, and once had a dad. In addition, this movie caught some flack for whitewashing Holly. In the books, she's described as having a coffee complexion, but in the films, she's played by the decidedly not coffee-toned Lara McDonnell. Granted, once upon a time, the very pale and very Irish Sir Ronan was signed on to play Holly, so chances are, this issue would have been present even in the earlier proposed version of the film. The entire Leprechaun unit is also pretty lame in the movie, actually, and Judy Dench playing Commander Root does not help. She's putting on the same weird voice affect as Mulch, giving an awkwardly raspy performance. They give her some atrocious one-liners too. At one point, she tells someone to get the four-leaf clover out of here. I groaned audibly. In another scene, her official leprechaun battle outfit is revealed, and it is laughable. There's a slow zoom build-up for her to deliver the line, Top of the morning. And it is so bad. Was it supposed to be badass? Was it supposed to be funny? I have no idea what tone the scene was going for. Honestly, I don't know what tone any scene is going for in this movie. I also need to note that Colin Farrell as Artemis' dad is completely distracting. The man looks like he's doing a magazine photo shoot in all of his scenes. It feels like he was given no direction whatsoever. Just get in there and look swarthy. Granted, his character is totally stripped down and barely recognizable from the morally grey criminal he once was, so what else is the guy supposed to be doing? Perhaps the most forgivable character change here is with the Butler family. Judy Butler in particular gets aged down from a teenager to a child the same age as Artemis. Fine, whatever, that doesn't really matter. However, the movie doesn't really do anything with her. She takes watch a few times and tells Artemis to eat a sandwich at some point. That's about it. Really, she doesn't even need to be there. She has no meaningful relationship with Artemis, even though the narration for some reason posits that she's the only one who can understand him because she's a child. Considering the movie version of Artemis has no depth whatsoever, something tells me he's not that hard to understand. Something else that made the Artemis Fowl series so enjoyable was the magic. It had rules, it had rich lore, and the books were constantly introducing clever little fantastical elements that Artemis had to outsmart with his tech skills. There's really no outsmarting or scheming present in the movie. Artemis doesn't really need to figure out anything at all, because lucky for him, his dad left behind a log that conveniently explains every magical being and element. We end up getting a lot of boring exposition via his log entries that Artemis finds, so we don't really get to experience the magic or bask in its wonder. It happens and then is immediately explained away. Really, there's no mystery solving or code cracking to be had here at all. Again, Artemis' schemes and capers are what made the series interesting, but the movie wouldn't dare retain anything interesting from the books. There is little build-up to Artemis negotiating with the fairies for a ransom. 45 minutes in, and Leprechaun is storming the foul manor and opening fire. There's no real tension surrounding the infiltration, because the audience barely knows why any of these characters are doing any of the things they're doing. We also need to talk about the MacGuffin, that is, the Aculos. The Aculos. The Aculos. The Aculos. The Aculos. What's the 
the Aculos. The Aculos? What is it? I don't see anything about an Aculos. They know we have the Aculos. This all-powerful artifact doesn't even exist in the original book series, and exists just to move the plot forward. The whole plot element insults your intelligence. Did they really think audiences were so stupid that they would blindly accept that some magical, all-powerful artifact was hanging out in the foul manor the entire movie? Owen Colfer knew how to write a story that was engaging, clever, and intelligent. He trusted his audience to be smart enough to follow along, and children generally appreciate it when the story doesn't condescend to them. The movie, however, condescends big time. It dumbs down the story quite a bit, to the point where any child over 11 is going to find it childish and insulting. Meanwhile, anyone under 11 will likely just be bored. And there's definitely, definitely nothing for the parents watching along. Find me an adult that wants to watch Josh Gad fling sand poop. I dare you. It's no wonder Disney decided to pull this $125 million monstrosity from the theaters, as a cinematic release would have created financial woes for them, much in the same way that their previous attempt at adapting a novel in the form of John Carter had done. This awful movie joins the ranks of other notorious failed adaptations like M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender. Despite being horrifically bad, the movie tacks on a final slap in the face. I'm pretty sure the ending is intended to set this up for a sequel, but do you really think anyone wants more of this? Please, we suffered enough. Do yourself a favor and go reread the books. You're better off forgetting that this movie exists. With that being said, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.